So uh, thank you for the great introduction. And I'm really happy to be here talking uh, about my research and, um, and actually trustworthy AI. And the talk is conveniently titled, uh, Do You Trust Me? And we'll see if you trust me at the end of this talk. Um, but essentially, I'll be talking about critical applications of machine learning and AI in uh, real world applications and specifically from the lens of uh, interpretability, explainability, and also the impact of misinformation. I think this is an, a complementary to the discussion just, that we just had, um, and mostly I approach it uh, from the point of view of working with clinicians and practitioners, and if they actually trust machine learning models or not. Because one of the challenges for uh, adoption of um, AI models in real world is for our experts to actually trust it. So uh, from that point of view, um, I'll, be, I'll be talking uh, about the AI and machine learning models. Uh, there is one more important piece here, which is auditing. Um, auditing of AI models where we get like uh, various vendors selling us models, we have to be able to understand what kind of impact they have and what are they actually using. So we will be talking about these aspects. Okay, so um, I was listening to the, uh, to the discussion that we just had and uh, one of the things that uh, I looked at a couple of years ago is uh, talking about this uh, motivated from this various applications that we see on the market today. So essentially, this particular uh, app said, hey, I can actually look at your skin and tell you if something looks suspicious or not. So this is for skin cancer detection. Um, and they had like a huge following, and this is actually back in, um, this is 2019-2020 uh, timeframe. And at the same time, there was another paper that came up studying these models, so these are deep learning models, con uh, convolutional neural networks to be specific, and they found that actually the skin markings uh, may actually throw off how the model looks at a particular mark. What that means is any kind of tattoos can actually be mistaken for um, skin cancer. Now you can say, wait, this is tattoos that, that confuse the algorithm, and this is not an AI problem. So let's take another example. The same year, and I actually am doing some throwback. Uh, I guess it's Thursday also. But we are talking about throwback because in 2019, we are still thinking about, hey, what are these models actually learning? So for instance, if you had texture of an elephant and the shape of a cat, and you made the third image, which is like shape plus texture, uh, the model uh, almost overwhelmingly classifies it as an elephant and not as a cat. So that actually brings the question, um, what are these models actually learning, right? Because in this example, I, we can all see what, what's going on, uh, but when we deploy on um, feature sets or uh, patient characteristics, it may not be that simple to see if something is wrong. And I call these non-critical applications, and again, some, for some throwback, we were still talking about uh, chatbots <laughs> at that time, and bias in chatbots uh, during that year. And we really did not uh, do not really know how these big models are making their decisions. So from, motivated from this came in the idea of interpretability and explainability. And uh, I'll be walking through that during uh, the next few slides here. Uh, but there are various approaches in how can we build trust in understanding uh, these models. So for instance, in my research here at Waterloo, I uh, look at AI for intelligent manufacturing. Uh, this is actually with various uh, companies and also with CPI here. Um, and uh, I work on AI for aviation operations, how to make those operations more robust and reliable. 
And uh, on other threads, uh, I work on time series representation learning, transfer learning, meaning as uh, our data changes over time, how do we still accomplish reliable performance? Uh, and yeah, and I'll be talking about that piece there, deep learning explainability, but I also work on domain priors, such as physics priors uh, in climate and such applications where we can, again, build trust experts, we, we have established, let's say, a lot of uh, physics prior based uh, guided knowledge uh, in terms of partial differential equations or so on. How can we actually inject that into the models so that we do reliable predictions and then actually also build trust? I also work on uh, AI for healthcare efforts, and this is where trust becomes extremely important. When we are specifically talking to um, a number of uh, domain experts and surgeons and clinicians, how do, we, how do I communicate that my model has this very good performance and hey, you should use it? So what is that interaction? Uh, how does that interaction play out? So I work with a university health network uh, on a liver transplantation, uh, multiple threads on burn surgical candidacy that I'll touch upon later in the talk. Uh, with the Grand River Hospital here on trustworthy and uh, trustworthy AI for healthcare, uh, and that's what Helen was mentioning. Where I have, uh, we have a lot of challenges to go through to even access the data. Um, but in the past, I've worked with surgical skill assessment for surgeons, and that is at uh, uh, USC, and also AI for COVID threats. So, how do we build trust with interpretability? So um, this is like, I guess, uh, when, uh, the time when I say it, the dictionary defines, uh, but essentially model interpretability is a degree to which an observer can understand the causes of a prediction. This is somewhat misleading because most machine learning models, they capture correlations and not causations. So they will, they are, so in other words, we should be talking about what does the model think as the causes for something? Because it's not actually observing everything when we go about our day-to-day -day lives. It's only observing a set of features to make decisions on. Very important to realize. Garbage in, garbage out, very true. You can find patterns where there ex exists none of it. So in interpretability, uh, we talk about Okay, let's find the, the features that the model is relying on. Now, you may have heard about interpretability and explainability. These are in fact two different things. The first of these, if we talk about interpretable models, I want you to remember this something like what you see is what you get. The model is making decisions on the pieces that it's showing you as being interpretable. I'll get uh, into some of the examples shortly. The second is, now my campsite is all closed, it's the black box models. Essentially, we don't really understand how the model is making decisions, but we have a pretty good estimate of how it's making decisions via some simpler models or approximations. And that is what explainability is. So what you see, it's close to what you get, but not really so. So let's actually talk about interpretability here. A number of you, if you have dabbled in any kind of machine learning or even statistical modeling, uh, may have uh, come across decision trees. And this is actually kind of the mainstay in healthcare. People love and clinicians love decision trees because that is, you just traverse down the tree and you make a decision and we exactly know how the model made the decision. So tomorrow, if you wanna come, come up to me and ask, hey, why did you classify me as something? I would say, this is why. And therefore, this is very popular in financial sector as well, who do have like some obligations to investors and so on. So this appears there as well. So this is what an example of inherently interpretable model would be. This is exactly what you see is what you get. Then again, the other workhorse of, uh, of bread and butter, I mean, even my bread and butter, I guess for the most part, is linear, linear regression. 
Uh, linear regression, essentially, if we have a house and we have a number of features, you can say, this is what the house price is determined by. We're still fitting lines, so we see that line there. But even to go back to that house example, we know that not all features impact the price. Right? There are only certain features that impact the price in some meaningful way. And that is where the idea of parsimony or sparsity comes into play. Essentially, even um, and the idea of parsimony can be motivated from our own um, um, like visual cortex as, as humans, is if I show you a picture of a dog, you'll be able to recognize it very, very quickly because our brains have essentially said, hey, this is what a dog looks like. But if I show you a mishmash of a dog, a giraffe, zebra, and a bunch of other animals, you'll, be, you'll, you'll take some time to say, oh, this piece of the puzzle comes from there, and this other piece comes from there, and so on. So in our mind, you can, very, very simplistic terms, we can think about there's just one, I just need to communicate one thing to you to say this is dog. Why, whereas if I see this mishmash of pulse puzzle pieces, I'll have to communicate five things. It has a nose of a dog, but tail of a zebra, and, and so on. And this is what the idea of sparsity is, the simple representations. And this is where what I looked at uh, a couple of years ago, where uh, we can think about uh, your, and, and the math part ends very quickly, uh, but I, this is just before lunch, so I do understand, but bear with me. Uh, so we have a data, we, we accumulate our data and put that into a matrix, which looks like uh, that thing there, uh, labeled as Y, and we want to represent it as a dictionary times something. What does that mean? The picture of a dog that I just talked about is essentially the columns of the matrix A, and there would be just one element in that matrix X which was light up the moment you see a dog. So, and that is known as the coefficient matrix, very similar to the coefficients that we are talking about in linear regression. Now, uh, to preface the next part, I'm trying to motivate how do we establish trust via theoretical models? And then I will get into why that is, may not be very practical and what, what the community is doing. Um, so coming back here, and one of the situations in this um, case, and in fact, this has been shown to be a bio, what we call bio-inspired model. This is uh, very similar to how our eyes actually recognize, or our visual cortex actually recognizes things when we go about our day-to-day -day lives. And I'll connect this to deep learning as well. So we, let's, let's uh, saddle up here. Um, so essentially, the challenge is, I gave you this data. I want to represent it as A times X. Those are both matrices. You can do this for tensors, by the way, higher order uh, uh, objects. But here, both A and X are unknown. And there are two things unknown makes our lives extremely difficult. So why is it important? As I said, parsimony, sparsity is extremely useful. I can communicate something very, very quickly, concisely, and they're flexible. I can represent multiple things. Same thing in multiple ways that actually can help me if I have uh, attacks coming in. If somebody wants to corrupt some of the things, I can actually have multiple ways to represent it. And also, they're very stable under noise. This is, again, about the attacks that we see. Somebody can inject some, some noise into your representations, but they will still be stable. So it's very important in that sense. So how do we learn them? So the goal is, I'm given by, I want to find A and X, A is what I'm calling my dictionary, and X is what I'm calling my coefficients. They will tell, up, tell me when a particular thing from the dictionary is present. And X is sparse. Sparse meaning it's, it has a few non-zeros only. Okay, the problem is that the associated optimizations that we end up solving are non-convex. It just means that they're just difficult to know if, difficult to actually find the true solution, the actual exact solution. And so what previous work 
actually looked at is, let's say I do find some dictionary, right? There is some error in it. It's a chicken and egg problem. I find the dictionary, and then I go and try to find my coefficients. But if there is error in the dictionary, it will percolate into the coefficients, and, and then you will again get stuck. So they were uh, essentially uh, completing that loop. You actually cannot have good enough guarantees, which essentially means that you cannot re recover those two elements, but you cannot even recover where non-zeros existed. That is known as a support which is pretty useless. You won't even know if, if you have a dog or a cat. It can just tell you that it's a dog if it gets stuck at a bad place, the optimization. And so the question was, how do, can we recover these sparse coefficients also? And this is where um, I will show you some more math. Um, essentially, there is a work that came up which said, hey, you can execute my algorithm and it's an iterative algorithm. You'll keep on executing it. And as time grows, right, your error will drop until you kind of hit this uh, speed, blo speed uh, block here, which is a non-negligible error. I will actually show you what this error is in the next few slides. But what that means is you can do better and better until you hit something. So some, that work that I just, just flashed for a second there essentially said, hey, let n go to infinity. The error goes away. Beautiful, but that never happens in practice. So what can be done? So essentially, uh, this was one of my works, uh, which is called Noodle. And it is a neurally plausible alternating optimization based online dictionary learning model. What that does is actually can recover the both factors exactly. You literally find what those, uh, oops, what those uh, elements are. I get rid of that factor, that speed bump that I talked about, you actually get rid of that. And you also have, there are some other benefits to it, but most importantly, what I'll show you is how quickly it converges. And we love linear convergence, and I'll show you. And it's also an online algorithm, meaning the more data you feed, the better and better it becomes. This is significant in the sense that the models, the, the optimization that I talked about are similar to what deep learning, the optimizations that we encounter in deep learning are. And finally, the last uh, slide, the most important thing to see here is we are actually, the, 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 the order K over N uh, term actually went away. So there's no bias. And with high probability, it will actually find both of the elements. Okay, let's see it in action. And that was the end of the math thing. So we see that, so in blue, I have a Noodle, my, uh, my proposed method. And the other methods are the baselines, and uh, you see that they hit that K over N very quickly, that, that speed bump that I talked about. And the blue line, so on Y axis, you have the error, and as your iterations go, which is the X axis, you have the zooming in effect. Not only that, each of those iterations actually only takes fraction of the time as compared to other methods. And on the last panel, I show you the recovery of the other factor. So actually, you can get to recover the true factors A and X. Okay, so what else? You can actually implement it as a neural network and this would be a guaranteed version of uh, a neural network here. Okay, after this work, you can say that, hey, I, am, I can actually give you guarantees, right? You can use this model, I'll give you that with high probability, this succeeds, right? And you can, we can go ahead into our world and it's all rainbows and nice. The problem is, uh, 
it's very difficult to do. It is very difficult. And there is a lot of assumptions that we need to make to be able to establish something like that. For instance, even if I add one more layer, my life is infinitely more difficult. And I know that this is exactly how, for instance, things like stochastic gradient descent is working, but very hard to generalize. And that is one of the reasons why theory right now is lagging behind the kind of things that we are seeing in the world right now. The theory cannot keep up. It takes so much time to do that. Um, so after doing that work, I was like, wait, how can we apply the same principles? Right? And at the same time, so we are still talking about interpretable models. At the same time, there's this work that came out, uh, which is called This Looks Like That. Essentially, the dictionaries that I was talking about, where we were learning these pro prototypes, what a dog looks like. The next time I see a dog, I can just recognize it. This work actually uses a deep learning model to learn those dictionary elements, right? They'll say, oh, this is a dog because this part, or here in case it's a bird, this is a bird because this is this particular species of bird because this wing looks like that, this beak looks like that, and, and so on, which is exactly what the idea of dictionary was. And so this is a, what we call as the prototype-based methods. And uh, based on this, we actually developed um, a deep fake detection um, model where we essentially explain why something was uh, categorized as a deep fake. And it will give you prototypes. It will give you these, uh, I guess it zooms into the eyes and says, you know what, this is what looks unnatural. And so you can actually uh, use prototype-based methods. And that will give you some level of trust in what is the model using to make decisions. The problem now is they do not perform that well. At, at well as in not as good as a really complex model which does not rely on prototypes. And that is where the second uh, part of it, the story here, which is explainability, comes in. Interpretability has its place, and in fact, in a lot of applications, you might prefer interpretability, but the things that you're seeing in, in the world right now, they, they are not interpretable at all, right? So, and, and they work really well, and in a lot of applications, for example, at least the consumer uh, type applications where people don't really care, it's not very critical, they're just chatting with ChatGPT, let's say, um, you might want to explain. I am not saying they are explainable. It is, I will, I will talk about it later. But this is what we call post hoc, meaning I've trained a model, now explain it to me. Um, meaning I will probably use something simpler to explain it. What you see is not what you get. Probably a good approximation. So, um, and on the top of uh, the chat GPT, we are essentially talking about, these are known as black boxes. Black boxes essentially means that OpenAI has the model, I don't have access to the model, I can only probe the model, I can put in some inputs, I can observe some outputs, and that's about it, right? Of course, uh, we're not going to talk about LLMs uh, in, I guess, a little later on, but not in detail, because they're slightly different from uh, some of the other models that um, we have extensively worked on. Um, specifically, a black box is essentially a model sitting, sitting somewhere, and you, as I said, you give it some inputs, and you only get to observe the outputs, and whatever is in the middle, the secret sauce, it's not revealed to you. And you want to still understand or explain its inner workings. And so uh, we uh, worked on uh, black box explainability. And uh, one of the most important thing here is something which is model agnostic, meaning the model could be uh, used for images, for text, for um, your healthcare data, like your EMR data. And the model should still be able to tell me what is important, what is the model using. And uh, we, in fact, tried this on uh, the uh, COVID, COVID-Net. COVID-Net was uh, actually developed here at Waterloo, uh, uh, Professor Alex Monk's uh, group. 
And uh, we explained it, uh, and this is on COVID X-ray data, where we can find, hey, this is the region that the model is focusing on. It's a great vessel region. But it's also focusing on some other things, right, which might not really be used by clinicians. And this is what I'm talking about as correlations. The model might be relying on, on what we technically, I guess more technically, we refer to as spurious correlations. For instance, if a bird already, always sits on a particular tree, you might be using tree to classify the bird. So that's, that's something that happens. But we are able to um, actually uh, accomplish uh, what we call a feature attribution, meaning this feature impacts this particular output, um, but also interaction. This feature, along with this other feature, leads to a particular output, which is, uh, in the example of text, will become uh, very clear in a bit. Um, and then we have to establish how that feature interaction impacted the, the output, which is known as the attribution. So let's take an example. So let's say if I say uh, this is a bad, terrible, awful, horrible movie, we all know that's a negative thing, right? But the models may actually say, hey, bad and terrible kind of align together, so they are positive. They have a positive effect. So uh, one of the things that we, uh, we did and our method, uh, which is known as uh, Archipelago, was able to say, you know what, we should disentangle this feature um, interaction detection and attribution. And what I mean by that is, um, on the last figure there, so if there is non relear relationship, we usually say there is an interaction there. They are modifying each other. Uh, people were using that delta both to find, hey, there is some deviation there's some interaction here, and use the same thing to say this is how big the interaction is. And we use, uh, I guess, to get slightly uh, more, uh, getting into the details here, we use phi for um, our attribution. But what does that mean? Um, so essentially, we came up with two methods, arch detect and arch attribute. This is uh, two um, components of archipelago. But now we were able to apply it to various modalities. So in text, I can say the regret and not extreme enough, they together lead to um, a negative, negative um, classification and so on. So this is BERT. This is, again, our, a language model that is extremely popular. And we can apply it to images, the same principle. And uh, we all uh, already saw the COVID extra example. So where else can we see this? So I, I briefly mentioned that I work um, a lot on AI for healthcare threats. And we were actually able to work with LA County Burn, uh, Burn Center, where uh, I guess at that point, uh, working in the United States, you do have, um, I guess, a lot of the data issues. You don't actually worry about the data. The data is available to you. Uh, uh, but yeah, they had done uh, a retro, they wanted to do a retrospective study, and we looked at uh, uh, patients coming in uh, to the burn center with a lot of burn wounds, and they wanted to make a determination if they want to operate on the patient or not. Now, something like that seems very, very critical, and we're like, hey, we should probably not be doing it. But even um, an experience like a like a mid-level like experienced surgeon would have a 50-50 chance of getting it right. So we're like, okay, well, if we can do better than a coin toss, we will probably help you. Um, and in fact, we were able to accomplish 23 to 88% improvement because there are a lot of people who are just starting off. And uh, not only that, we were able to develop an app for them that they could use. And this is just for internal deployment that they could use, and they can make determination. Now, where does explainability come in here? They were looking, we can actually apply archipelago here to say, this is the region that the model is focusing on. Does it look okay to you? Do you believe it? Do you trust the model? Um, here at uh, Waterloo, um, I work with uh, a university health network, Toronto. Again, I guess the data piece is, uh, this is well established. And we're looking for uh, looking at liver transplantation. We, uh, and we want to see if 
if a particular, what is the survival if I make this particular liver available to a particular patient, and how are their outcomes on a wait list once they get wait listed for liver? One of the most important thing here that I did not realize going in is that liver is the only organ where even if one function goes bad, you have to do the transplantation. Like, there is no other way. There is no particular tweak that you can make. Air liver controls over 500 functions, and you have to transplant the whole thing. So everybody gets on the wait list, which is extremely, um, like extremely concerning. And there, of course, there is a lot of research going on into seeing if they can replace the liver function. That's like an interesting side note there. Um, but then we were able to develop a deep learning based model and, uh, and actually also explain it. And that's what, is the, what are the factors? Um, when we look at uh, another interesting fact here, when we look at US data, uh, which is actually publicly available, um, insurance actually plays a huge role. So again, um, and not, not, not in uh, the Canadian context, but very, very interesting to see. Um, okay, so to kind of summarize that discussion, we can go about a theory-guided way. We can develop exact guarantees to what we want to do. We can um, know their limits and then understand the decision-making. The other way to accomplish this is interpretability, explainability, and domain priors. But is that enough? And um, in the last part here, I would like to um, actually draw attention to how misinformation can be a huge issue here in, in trust and also actually national security at some level. Um, so for instance, oh, those, both of those images are fake and uh, we are trying to figure out how, how can you tell uh, if something is fake or not? Similar to how I just, uh, uh, I guess a couple of years ago we were looking at deep fakes and trying to explain if something is a deep fake. Um, and in fact, I did work on one of the, oh, one of the first uh, works on COVID uh, misinformation. So this is March uh, 2023. And uh, we, we saw how, let's say, a particular tweet makes its rounds across the world. And uh, ultimately, like this originated in the US, makes its rounds, and even in the US and how it spreads. So, it's, it's actually pretty, um, I guess now it's much more challenging uh, with Twitter uh, moving to X, but at least looking at that data, we could actually see that there were coordinated uh, like interaction among different accounts in spreading a particular piece of misinformation. So this becomes an extremely important thing, even in the context of large language models. Uh, for instance, you may have seen a lot of news reports saying uh, ChatGPT can pass the medical licensure exam and it, it can like pass the bar and it can pass whatever. But one of, and, and we wanted to look into this because it seemed like, oh, well, that is a lot of capability. Um, but essentially most of them were looking at uh, ChatGPT's ability to solve multiple choice questions. But real world is not multiple choice. Uh, we all wish, I guess. Um, so we looked at LLM uh, for healthcare and in the context of misinformation, came up with a methodology for evaluation because remember, these are black boxes. We need to probe them in a particular way and they're also probabilistic. We'll not probably get the same response every time we probe it. Um, and uh, putting that to test, we have two human assessors looking at the responses on the exams, we took out the choices. Essentially, we are just feeding ChatGPT the prompts, the question. And we analyze the, actually overall, it only gets it partially correct, but even if you look at those uh, 23, um, the, the, these, I guess the responses that it did get right, on further ablation analysis, it actually um, is not that reliable. Not only that, it is actually more optimistic when it is more likely to get it wrong than when it actually gets it right. So 
not only to end uh, my uh, talk here, I would say in addition to this piece of trust and uh, which is guided by theory, interpretability, explainability, and domain priors, there is also a need to stop misinformation. And uh, that is, um, I guess, the, where, um, and with, with large language models, that the rate at which this information would be, uh, we would be able to generate and spread, um, not we, I guess, bad actors can generate and spread misinformation, is actually pretty uh, scary. And uh, that actually does create um, issues for our security and um, national security, actually. So uh, with that, I would end my talk, and I'll be happy to take any questions, or we can, I guess it's time for lunch also, so I'll be around. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>